Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad that you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We're going to be talking about the nature of healing, and in fact, the future of healing. What's happening on this planet relative to this ancient, ancient idea, spiritual notion, actually, and what we can be prepared for, for what is coming our way. You know, there are times in history that uh, create shifts in an entire way of thinking and looking. If you think about the change from the geocentric theory, for instance, that entire way of thinking pervaded, as far as we know, the world at that time that thought that the Earth was the center, the very center of not only the solar system, but perhaps even the universe. Then there came a time when we believed, according, by the way, to scientific inquiry, that the sun was really the center, the heliocentric theory. And our thinking changed accordingly. We began to conceive of the universe entirely differently than we had up to that point in history. And that thinking began with the artists, the scientists, the philosophers, the religious people, the clerics even, and then slowly and surely filtered into all levels, all strata of society. It's not a quick change. And it's one that often meets with tremendous resistance. Now, in the last several centuries, we've come across the upsurge of technologies, industrialization. And these provided us, we society, human society, with yet another kind of change. Perhaps not as vast as the change from geocentric to heliocentric, but no less, we humans expe expect and uh, experience change, not in the greatest way. For us, change represents something to be avoided if possible. Yet, in fact, we know that change is really the only constant. We have that from our own current scientific inquiry, and we also have that from the ancient Chinese, from the Tao Te Ching, which says something of the order that the only constant is change itself. What we're finding is that these ancient pearls of wisdom are meeting today with the scientific mind and what has been said and understood by many sages of old, is now being, as it were, fleshed out through mathematical formulas, through scientific understandings, through principles, laws of nature. This should not come as any surprise. After all, each is a belief system, and when one relies on one's intuitive nature, coupled with one's observational power, all sorts of very interesting things ensue. So we're in a situation now in our history. We are, we are positioned looking out over the perching out over the 21st and 22nd and 23rd centuries and changes indeed are afoot. One of the ones I want to focus on today is represented in and discussed in this book, Sanctuary, The Path to Consciousness, by Stephen Lewis and Evan Slauson. Some of you who watch the show regularly have seen my interviews with Stephen Lewis over the past couple of months. I invited Stephen onto the show because of work I feel he is doing that is extremely remarkable. It represents, as far as I'm concerned, the new wave of healing, the future, if you will, of medicine, even though he doesn't discuss it quite that way, that is before us. Now, in fact, for those of you who may be familiar 
with the uh, arts and sciences of radionics, even of nutrition. There have been rather radical uh, practices going back to the 20s, radical that is for their time and even for our time now, which used electricity, that used frequency, that generated frequencies such as the right frequency generator to stimulate life force in a patient or in a human being in order to help that person heal him or herself. In short, the body has the wisdom, that is, nature has the wisdom, or whatever it is that created the body and nature has the intelligence, of course, far beyond our own, to affect the necessary changes in the body so that what we refer to as healing can take place. It's a formidable process about which we actually don't understand a whole lot. That doesn't mean, however, that we don't tinker with the process and tinker with the body in such ways that we have become able to stimulate some levels of healing. So back in the 20s, there were a, a group of very innovative thinkers who developed something called radiesthesia and radionics. Then a little later, there was Royal Remington Rife who developed a machine that was actually tested by the medical authorities at the time and proven to be able to heal all manner of degenerative diseases, including cancer, for a series of economic and political reasons uh, that never saw any further light of day. It was published and discussed back then in medical circles because medical schools across the country had sent their terminally ill patients to Royal Remington Rife down in San Diego who was working with a physician from LA and in fact they healed, they cleansed these terminal patients, otherwise known as, of all their disease. There was one person who did die, and he died not from the Rife machine not working, but because the Rife machine actually worked so well, clearing the toxins from the person's system, of which there were so many, based largely on their standard medical, conventional medical treatment at the time, and I dare say even today, and the person died from autotoxification, not from the disease. So this idea of vibrational medicine has been written up by a well-known physician named Dr. Richard Gerber in his book uh, Vibrational Medicine, commonly known as. And this is generally available in the bookstores, Barnes and Noble, and where have you. You can find it. And uh, it is based on a series of documented research, studies, etc. for those who are uh, interested in that kind of inquiry and those kinds of proofs. You can find them. They do exist, as well as the theoretical underpinnings of this kind of medical approach. Well, <clears throat> as time has gone on, there have been refinements. And among these are the refinements that Stephen Lewis has come up with in his system known as the AIM program. Now I interviewed Steve back in November and in December was so impressed I went out and spent some time at his offices out in LA and watched him hour by hour, day by day, testing the life force in people whose photographs he had received because it's all done by photograph. As I said, this is something that actually has been going on for quite some time. This is not his innovation. And two, significant effect. So having become fascinated with what he's doing, I studied with him to some extent, and I decided to invite him to New York for our wonderful community here of people who want healing, who want to know about healing, who want to have their energy fields balanced and lead healthy, wonderful, satisfying, more conscious lives. 
And that, in fact, is what energetic balancing offers. I have gotten a number of inquiries from many of the viewers about those interviews. I'm very glad to say that people had this experience. They had a sense that what was being discussed was intuitively obvious. There was some sense of knowing that what was being discussed of matching a frequency that is in the body and around the body with an antidote frequency, a neutralizing frequency, could create a balance in one's general field such that people's disorders, people's patterns, negative patterns would dissipate and dissolve. And I have spoken to people all across the country, down in Florida, around San Francisco and Arizona, and they all say that this is in fact happening. When people submit their photograph to the AIM and through the AIM program and with an application, etc., they find that all sorts of things with which they have been plagued or certainly disturbed for oftentimes many years begin to disappear. Migraine headaches, for instance, urinary tract infections, on and on, uh, joint pain, arthritic conditions, all sorts of things. Now, these folks in the AIM program are not involved in treating anything, disease or anything. That's not what they're up to. They work purely with the energy field. Now, what medicine's understanding is of the energy field is actually nil. There isn't even recognition or acknowledgement of an energy field by and large, and what its relationship is to the disease of the physical body or the health or wellness, for that matter, of the physical body remains a huge question. What I'm saying is that there is a relationship between one's health and one's energetic condition. And I believe, my understanding, is that Stephen Lewis would say the same thing. It's in that light that I have invited him here. He will be at the Shelburne Hotel on Friday night, March 3rd. That's this coming Friday night, 7 o'clock. It's a free lecture. Please come. He will be, for those people who request it, uh, doing what are called mini evaluations in which he uh, takes one's thumb, as it's described in the book, Sanctuary, the Path to Consciousness, and probes and gets readouts through his software program of what it is that is going on energetically with the person and what he would need to do in order to help bring that person back into balance. So those are available, but you would have to call ahead of time because uh, there are very few spaces left for people to uh, enjoy that aspect of the work. But the main thing is not that anyway. The main thing is that there is this, what you could refer to as futuristic kind of spiritual technology, which is now interfacing in the lives of hundreds and thousands of people at this point in time across the country. And people are deriving tremendous healthy benefits from so doing. This is a phenomenon. This is why I wanted to talk about this today and make it the, the centerpiece of today's show. What engaged me personally is that through the AIM program, through the work Stephen Lewis is doing, I see the potential to bring balance and harmony and healing to a vast number of people in a fairly short amount of time. Because of the structure of the energy balancing, that is through a photograph, thousands upon thousands of people can get balanced, can come into harmony with themselves, higher and lower. And it is not relying upon a solo practitioner to affect these ends. If we were to do that paradigm, it could take dozens and dozens of years. But with this paradigm, with the very structure that he and his partner have developed, 
there is actually no limit to the number of people that can be receiving the balancing frequencies at any given point in time. And for me, this promised such a potential shift in the health, wellness, and consciousness of our human society, I couldn't resist. That's what motivated me to go out and spend time with them. That's what's motivated me to bring them to New York. Now, we don't know that if all people all of the time will experience the balancing effects of this work. Who can say that? Nobody can say that. But there is an interface, no matter what, on some interesting vibrational level of what they're doing and our own fields. And somewhere in the universe, there is some positive change. I would go so far as to say one's own biological, psychobiological universe, and even spiritual universe. There is a shift that is occurring, visible or not. I understand that theoretically. And what I have heard from the stories of people who have been involved in the AIM program for approximately a year, it is happening regularly and consistently on a number of different levels, obviously including physical. So it's in that light that I bring this up. Just if you can go back first to Plato's cave. This is the way I come to understand this. Our way of seeing in said cave was quite limited. Looking up and <laughs> looking out was something uh, considered a rare moment and an innovation. And most people took the life inside the cave as the be all end all of what was possible. But now we live in a time of great potential, possibility, and through the nature of quantum physics, probability. And what didn't ever seem possible before is now possible. Another example of a shift in consciousness in more recent times over the last couple of centuries is the innovation of electricity. Now before electricity was present, if you would put yourself into this mindset, think of someone explaining to you what electricity is. It's this invisible energy that courses through space between two poles, a positive and a negative. And even if you reach out and don't see anything, but you're in the, in the direction or in the space between those two poles, you can get zapped. Well, you know the way most people think most of the time. They'd say, what are you, crazy? This is not possible. You mean you can't see it, and yet you can just walk through a certain field and you get zapped? And what does zapping mean anyway? To zap. You know, what kind of verb is it? I've never seen that in the dictionary in the 19th century. Well, in fact, electricity did exist, became developed, and is now so popular no one wants to have a home without it. This is an example of human beings getting in touch with things, using their whole brain, using their intuitive nature as well, allowing possibility and changing. The jet plane and people will fly in the sky on iron wings. <laughs> It wasn't very long ago, in many people's lifetime to this day, that the whole idea of a flying machine was preposterous. It's just not possible. How could metal hang suspended in the air? What kind of dynamic would there have to be for it to propel forward and not fall? And how would you land the darn thing without a crash? All of it, I mean, just the idea, forget about the, uh, the details of landing, just the idea of metal, iron, floating in the sky and propelling us through the air at incredible speeds. 
this is too much for the common mind. And it was too much. However, as it is with such things, slowly and surely we become accustomed to that reality. And so it is, I say, with vibrational medicine and with this notion of energy balancing, which is now here to stay. Just notice for a moment, if you go back over the past just five years, five years, hospitals, Mount Sinai and others are now using acupuncture, aromatherapy, they're toying with the use of herbs. Some of them have used, begun using homeopathy. Now, why is this happening? except for that these other modalities, commonly referred to as alternative medical modalities, work. They work. And furthermore, we don't have very coherent explanations from a scientific point of view of how they work. But we do know that they work. They yield results. We can study these results. We see these results. And perhaps more than anything, we feel these results. It shows up in blood tests. It shows up in biopsies. It shows up in the health and well-being of people's lives. So what I am saying, dear friends, that science is but one religion of many. It's a way of seeing. It's a lens through which we can view our world. It is but one view. The ancients that have vast wisdom, going back to the shamanic cultures, going back to old religious and spiritual cultures, didn't have our language of science. They had their own, not one whit less valid. So we would be accused of high hubris if we thought that somehow our brand of science as it exists today is somehow the be all end all of testing phenomena that occur in the world. God knows and scientists know there are anomalies all over. So we must be very attentive to our ego's drive, if you will, toward arrogance of knowing everything. We do not. Any fine scientist will apprise you first of the vastness of what he does not know faster than he will disclose to you what he feels he does know. And a good scientist is really like an artist. He is and she is involved in an inquiry, which is what the Latin term really means. It, it means the pursuit of knowledge, scientia. That's what it means, knowledge. It doesn't mean prove it my way. Science itself and its, its modalities, its testing procedures are constantly being changed, transformed, mutated, because they need to be, because they're often not sufficient for the phenomenon being studied. So we must be careful not to be accused of arrogance or hubris. What we really would rather have is, I believe, is an attitude of openness, of possibility. Because we know neurochemically that when people have that attitude, what we could refer to as magic happens, delight occurs, happiness opens, the heart and mind enjoy a bath of pleasure. So it is when we contemplate these new ideas as in the AIM program that I'm very pleased to bring to New York and present you all with. I'll say again, March 3rd, Friday, March 3rd, there will be a talk by Stephen Lewis at 7 o'clock at the Shelburne Hotel, 303 Lexington Avenue at 37th Street. But please call 420-0800, area code 212-420-0800, to let me know you're intending to come. It's an informal reservation because we have limited seating and I have to have a way of gauging how many people are coming.
Then, because we know we won't have enough space that evening for everybody who wants to come, there will be another evening, which is Monday, the following Monday, March 6th, at the Beekman Hotel at 49th and 1st Avenue, just north of the UN, on nothing other than Mitchell Place. Yes, I kid that they've named that street after me a long time ago. Anyway, uh, so again, a free talk. For those of you who might be interested in the mini evaluations, you must call me or must email me at mjr at a better world dot net, mjr at a better world, one word, dot net, or you can call at 212 420 Zero, zero. And uh, you can uh, book such an appointment and we still have some spaces left for next week. So this presents you with some idea of what is afoot. God knows as a society we need some simple cost-effective answers to our health care delivery system. I, I laugh when I say the phrase because medicine has become an industry and there's God knows there's nothing wrong with making money there's a lot good about making money however if it is going to cost people their homes if it's going to cost people everything they've got to pay for insurance which isn't even the treatment it's just the insurance and people are not getting healed even from the most advanced allopathic techniques. It is time to find and explore to the hilt other ways of relating to the human body and the human field altogether. To think of the human being as just a body mechanically is one of allopathic medicine's first errors. Only now they are saying, yes, there is an emotional life to a human being that we can even test and probe a little bit. There is a spiritual nature to a human being. But after that sentence and after the surgeons pray before they grab their scalpel, you know, it is now in the hands of God. Other than that, there is no rigorous recognition and utilization of these other aspects of ourselves. So for my vote, I'll tell you, I'm interested in a medicine that deals with the whole person. After all, many of you know, I am a holistic psychotherapist and an acupuncturist. So my training has been in looking at the whole picture, the whole paradigm of a human being relative to his environment or her environment. And that is what we're dealing with now, with the AIM program as shown here. So, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you in my living room here and discussing these very important points. Please join us Friday, March 3rd at 7 o'clock at the Shelburne Hotel, 303 Lexington Avenue at 37th Street. and. March 6th, Monday evening at 7 o'clock at the Beekman Hotel at 49th and 1st on Mitchell Place. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all at the events and next week.